and those that are watching us on Channel 16 or at SiouxFalls.org. Uh, we'll begin our meeting today with a report from Deborah Owen, City Clerk, Chief of Council Operations. Deborah? Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Testing. <laughs> Thank you and good afternoon, Sioux Falls City Council. If we could just take a moment to go over our 7 o'clock agenda. There are some notes in there that, I, that have been updated since they were sent to you on Friday. Um, but just to go through the ones that are there as well, uh, there will, there's a request to amend the irregular agenda to uh, move item 15 up uh, to follow, oh, pardon me, yeah. to move item 15 to be first, that's right, pardon me, after the uh, public input. And so we'll take a motion in a second, so you'll need to make a motion to adopt the regular agenda and then amend it as you so wish. And then also there'll be an amendment for item number three, and that's simply to change the word commission to city council in the final sentence and the instructions are there. Also, in addition, um, item four, and that's, that's the commission to redistrict. They are actually moving ahead very quickly and have now selected their map. They're going to recommend to the citizens and have public hearings. And so if you would be so kind, the city clerk will be here, pardon me, the assistant city clerk will be here to read these amendments into the minutes. If you could just put a motion in a second and then have her read these into the record, that may be the easiest as we're going to expedite that timeline so that we can get the new map adopted before candidates declare for the April 2012 election. And then also number five and six uh, is a request by me uh, to put an emergency clause on both the ordinance to call the election and the ordinance to pay for the election. Uh, and this would simply make the ordinance would take effect upon the vote of the council and publication. We wouldn't have to wait the 20 days. State law does allow us to do that, but it would allow us to use, utilize those funds immediately as we want to begin planning and, and will incur expenditures for the election um, right away. And then if you could, we'll just talk, there's a map at your desk, and what, it's this huge 11 by 17, and there's some copies over here. They're also available online for anybody who would want to look at those. This is the recommended map by your commission to redistrict. It is map B, and uh, the precincts that are being, that would be moved if they move forward with this map would be, there's, if you look at that yellow, which is the central district, uh, the top one looks a little bit like a, the game Tetris, like one of those game pieces, if you will. It's 413. That would then move uh, to, to central from where it would be in, um, it's in the northwest section now. In addition, uh, down, it's 1-1. One, one. It says yellow, but it really has, if you look at the precinct number, it, it would be, oh, pardon me, it's in the northeast section. It would move to central. And then 1-1, one, one, which, uh, which is currently in the southwest, would then move to central. That's why it's yellow in color, but it really has the, the prefix of 1 for southwest. In addition, 515 and 55, they're blue over next to the yellow, the central district. Those actually would move back into the northeast from central. So four precincts that would be moved, that was the least amount of precincts that the, that the commission had reviewed in terms of map changes. And they, did, they wanted to uh, create the least amount of movement for the city. And they did give credit to the former commission who worked uh, very hard to redistrict a couple of years ago so that there wouldn't be as many changes this time around. So it's four precincts that would be moved if they go ahead and, and move forward with this map. 79,000 people. Oh, pardon me, 7,900 7, people would be affected. And again, 1-1 one, one and 4-13 would move to Central, and 5-16 and 5-5 would move to the Northeast. They will be having public hearings on this map, and we'll notify all of those who are in those districts that will be potentially be moved. Uh, it will be September 15th from 6.30 to 8 o'clock, and September 17th from 10 a.m. to 11.30, all at the Carnegie Town Hall, and we'll be releasing more information about that in the future, but wanted to give you an update as they have been moving expeditiously on this project. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Owen? Thank you, Deborah. We'll then go on to a report from Councillor Jameson on the Audit Committee meeting of July 26th. I would call it a, an update versus a, a report. 
But uh, I would let you know that uh, we had four reports that we, we reviewed, a uh, street operations report, a CAFR review report, a Reno Orpheum uh, management contract, and police cash handling. Uh, no real major findings in either report, but Rich Oakso will be giving those detailed reports. He'll give two of them on September 6th and two other reports on September 26th. So two on the 6th and two on the 26th. So look for those in September. Any questions for Councillor Jameson? If not, thank you, Councillor. We'll now go on to City Council open discussion. Councillor Karski. Yes, um, last Tuesday we had our national night out and I just want to give a special shout out to someone. We had a visit, uh, our first stop was on Holly Avenue and met with a couple, they were both, um, one was bound to a wheelchair, the other one on a mobility cart and they have road construction, they're tearing up their street in their neighborhood and I asked them how it was going for them and they said thank you to, um, well, Matt Carlson, a construction supervisor with Carl V. Carlson gave them his personal cell phone number and um, said if you ever need anything call me. They also built them a special ramp for during the construction so they could get in and out of their property easier. I think that's going way above and beyond and just you know, needs to be recognized for the work that that contractor and that individual did. So I, I'm proud of him and I called him up and I thanked him. So. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Brown. I just wanted to give you a couple quick updates on the Homeless Advisory Board. We met today. The Salvation Army, as you know, has provided the uh, winter warming house in January, February, March, sometimes into April. There are questions about whether they're going to do that again. On average, they were getting about 38 people a night during uh, those months, and we're still working with them to determine if they're going to do that in the next uh, winter season. Another item I wanted to bring up to date, um, the Public Services Committee um, will actually be taking a look at a housing trust fund. Um, City, uh, City Bank is helping fund getting a start on this. And this is going to be targeted at um, creating apartments for those with incomes of $20,000 a year or less, which is exactly what the housing uh, study we did last year indicated was the biggest need. So you're going to be hearing more about that through the committee and how that might be funded. And then finally, um, next week at the joint meeting with Minnehaha County, I finished my last meeting there today and Councillor Erpenbach um, is set to fill my spot and you'll be voting on that next week. Um, I've served on that board for six years now. Just to give you a sense of the demographic changes in our community, when I started six years ago, a third of our children in the school system qualified for free and reduced lunches. Today, that's more like 43% and some schools are reaching in excess of 80% of their student body qualifying for free and reduced lunches. And last week I heard in the news that one in seven Americans are now on food stamps. So we can't pretend that the problems don't exist here. Thank you. Other council open discussion, Councillor Erpenbach. I just wanted to comment on my, I finally did after a year take my ride along with the police department. I assume I'm the last council member to do that, but um, I just wanted to congratulate our, you know, they really are our, our local heroes. Um, the evening started with requalifying in the gun range, so I did get my souvenir earplugs for that. But the rest of the evening was a lot of social work. And I just, I kept saying it to the guys that I was, I was riding with, the officer Steve Redman, and I kept saying that to him, that his, his skill levels, his skill sets are so broad that it was just amazing to watch from that, you know, gun range practice to dealing with uh, family incidents and neighbors who are disputing and those kinds of things. Um, it was a very quiet night and he kept saying, this is so boring, I'm really sorry. But it was okay for a chicken to be there and, and riding along. So I just wanted to thank the police department for allowing me to go and, and uh, just congratulate them on the work they do. Thank you. Any other open council discussion? If not, I have one item. Um, thank you all for sending me your schedules for August. This is a busy group. Uh, I found one August date, and that will be August 24th at 4 p.m. And in order to have our second meeting, we're going to have to go into September. And so I am asking if September 7th, that is also a Wednesday, would work for the council, 4 p.m. If that ends up being a problem for anyone, would you please let me know? But put August 24th, 
4 p.m. for our first budget work session. Thank you. We'll now go on to our presentations. We'll begin this afternoon with our River Greenway, or yes, our River Greenway Development Phase One and Two updates by Director Don Kearney and John Jacobson. Good afternoon, City Council members. Don Kearney with Parks and Recreation. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to give you an update on the River Greenway project. Uh, it, we're making good progress out there. And it's really a timely update now that the project's more than 50% complete. And it's also in timely in that uh, the result of Judge Pearsall's decision to allow us to use the entire balance of the Big Sioux River Environmental Trust Fund uh, really allows us to provide you some good information as it relates to closing out uh, phase one and the timeline for that, but also um, the anticipated schedule for phase two and um, which is really slated to start uh, next year. But before I turn it over to John Jacobson, who's gonna do the bulk of the presentation, I do wanna introduce our project team. Uh, they do a lot of work in the background, don't get a lot of recognition, and so I'd like to recognize them before I turn it over to John. Uh, the first person is our project manager, uh, that is Brad Ludens. Uh, Brad is with City Engineering, uh, he's on the project every day. And then I'd also like to recognize Tori Miedema, Tori works in our department, uh, is our capital development specialist, and works hand in hand with Brad and with John Jacobson, our consultant on the project, uh, to make sure that things stays on track as it should. So with that, I turn it over to John. Good afternoon, Council. John Jacobson with Confluence. Uh, most of you know me and have seen me up here before. Um, we will just briefly We'll just briefly give a summary of where we're at today. Of course, you know that our current downtown River Greenway master plan was approved by FEMA in 2010, uh, in November of 2010, and that was our first big hurdle in starting our improvements. It goes from Falls Park to Faywick Park. Phase one, you can see highlighted in red, it essentially covers the east bank between 6th Street and 8th Street, and also covers the west bank starting at the pedestrian bridge going south to 8th Street along River Tower Apartments. And then we have a small new pedestrian crossing there at 6th Street. Phase two, you can see, is highlighted in orange. I'll get into that in a little bit more detail here, but essentially that goes from 8th Street to the south to the existing uh, pedestrian crossing bridge that's there. Um, we started construction on phase one. Um, in the middle of 2010, uh, the middle of December of 2010, the reason why we wanted to do that is obviously we can control the river um, during the winter time a little easier than we can in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, the existing railroad bridge that crosses in front of Sharapa Place was removed um, towards the end of January of the beginning of the year. The bulk of our project, the river walls and everything that uh, separate the project from the river are all essentially anchored into the existing bedrock um, that underlies the whole entire project. Most of you have been on a number of tours of the project over the last uh, six months and you've been able to see that, but the construction process, building it that way, can be a little slow and time consuming. Of course, one of our big hurdles during construction has been contaminated soils and groundwater. Um, as I had mentioned in our presentations about the Big Sioux River Trust Fund and other Greenway presentations, um, the section of the river along there has been polluted for 100 years uh, due to uh, coal tar soils and other contaminants being uh, dumped into the river uh, to fill it in and straighten it out. So we don't know where all those are at. So it's like a, it's, it's just kind of something when we start digging, we encounter them, and then we have to deal with them. They have to be excavated. Um, and hauled out to the city landfill for disposal, proper disposal. Um, one of our other uh, issues that we ran into is in, you know, if you take a good look at Falls Park, you'll see how it is, and that's the bedrock itself. It goes up, down, and all over the place. Of course, prior to construction of the project, we did a lot of due diligence to determine um, where the bedrock was at and what heights it was at, but as you can see in this picture here, um, the site project superintendent is standing over on the left side, and you can just see how the rock goes up and down over six feet there. And so that's a lot like the soils. Once we expose it, we've kind of got to figure it out and deal with it. 
because of that, in a few spots, the bedrock was way deeper than what we had hoped and anticipated. So we had to switch over to an alternative foundation system for some of the river walls. That's essentially a helical anchor system that gets screwed down into the soils and rest on the bedrock. Um, a lot of the progress over the six months, this is a picture of uh, one of the new pedestrian bridge abutments on the east side of the river. That, of course, is faced in quartzite stone. This is construction of some of the new uh, river walls and stairway access. Of course, one of the goals of the improvements is to increase access through ramps and steps into the greenway. Um, this is construction that began in early July of the main plaza um, along the project. This is, of course, one, going to be one of the primary gathering areas of the phase one project. Um, this is a river wall portion of that plaza project uh, getting faced in quartzite stone. And then based on Don mentioned the approval of the Big Sioux River Trust Fund, we were able to start construction on the south end of our project uh, near, near Falls Landing in the hotel. So um, phase one, we're expecting substantial completion at the end of October. Um, the primary east side bike pathway will be open to allow for winter and pedestrian use because those pathways are cleared during the snow once all the uh, snow is removed off the streets. The new pedestrian bridge is expected to be installed in mid-September. And then we'll have a number of miscellaneous items like landscaping, ornamental metal, some signage, and other things that will have to occur in the spring of next year. Phase two, as I mentioned, uh, we're looking at right now will be right on the south side of the 8th Street uh, Bridge going to the existing uh, railroad bridge and pedestrian crossing that's there. Of course, that's one of the potential redevelopment sites right now um, based on the City of Sioux Falls RFP. And you'll also notice that it's also the main site of the downtown river ramp. This is a view looking from the north um, towards the project site. You can see the river ramp in the background. Um, right now, one of the horrible things about 8th Street and the Greenway is that the access is very, very poor and very limited. There's only two spots to get off 8th Street right now under the Greenway. Those are both steps. Um, one of those we're reconstructing and making more accessible right now as part of the Phase 1 project. But this is the stairway that leads down into the Phase 2 project into a parking lot. So anyone from the public who goes into the project needs to go through a parking lot first. Um, of course, this is our prime project site right now. It all falls underneath the existing river ramp. Um, the river ramp needs to be removed um, in order for us to build our improvements along there. And uh, the last, this is our last photo. This is the existing railroad bridge that's there right now that we will be building up to with the phase two improvements. So the primary design, the detailed design of Phase two will occur here during the fall and winter of this year and into uh, the winter here coming up. Um, as I mentioned, the existing river ramp needs to be removed for our construction to occur. Um, we will be going through coordination with the landowners, much like what we've done with phase one. Obviously, there's a very important public-private relationship there that needs to be maintained to get these improvements built. We're hoping to bid phase two in the May of 2012 um, with construction being complete in November of 2012. The approximate construction budget for phase two is about two and a half million dollars. And I should note that the approval of the Big Sioux River Trust Fund has been very important both for phase one in the fact that we've been able to deal with the contaminated soils and tipping fees and all that stuff we've had to endure, but also helps with this phase two as well, um, giving us funds to deal with those very same issues and ultimately uh, really begins to clean up a number of environmental issues as far as water pollution and sediment control and those sorts of things. So we will have another update for you at about 90% completion of the phase one project. And of course, we'll have a tour at the same time. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Mr. Jacobson. <coughs> Councilor Jamison. I love what you're doing there. It looks great. I was out there beyond the uh, safety zones looking around. Uh, what do you do if phase two cannot start because the river ramp does not come down? What do you do? Well, we'll have to, 
ultimately, we've got another contingency plan. Uh, the portion in front of Killian Community College right now is an available site uh, for construction using these same funds. Um, it'll be easy for us to get into. We haven't wanted to do that just because we wanted to focus on the redevelopment sites. Um, and the reason uh, we really want to focus on that phase two project area is if there is a new hotel built there, um, we want to be able to piggyback onto that. But ultimately, as we construct further phases, we want them to touch and come together as we go because our access is so hard and limited. So we do have other options if, if we weren't able to do that. If I could, is there anybody that, that's aware of the, uh, looking for Darren possibly, but the RFP that was issued for that redevelopment of that area and the removal of that ramp, do you know by chance, I thought the RFP included the removal of the ramp. Based on what I know, it does include that, but I can't speak to it in detail. Does anybody else? Don? Yeah, I, I believe that the uh, initial proposal does uh, uh, contemplate the removal of that river ramp, whether um, uh, it's just a question of the value of the land versus the actual um, cost to remove that as part of that entire equation. And so I think that's something that Darren Smith and his team are currently evaluating. Um, obviously, the timing of that is critical from our perspective as well. And so, uh, as John said, if, if that doesn't look like it's a, it available to us because of uh, it's not moving on the same timeline that we are, we'll look to, to work with Darren to, to reassess where we're at on that timeline and then uh, take, take uh, alternate steps if we don't have to happen to have access to that particular site. What I just wanted to bring is, is maybe a more of an awareness is that I remember the RFP is the same kind of deal where if they agree to the terms of the RFP, they would gain ownership of that parking lot, but by doing so, they would have to remove the ramp. But in the CIP, it shows a million dollars for removal of the ramp. So I'm not sure that I have all the facts straight, but clearly if we spend a million dollars to remove the ramp and then another proportion, uh, I don't even know how much phase two is, uh, 2.5, uh, to improve this greenway, I, I just think the true cost should probably be explained. Uh, to the true investment of enhancing our greenway, which is very important, but I, I was hoping to fully understand the RFP process of, of, I thought it covered the removal of the ramp, but then I see in the CIP there's a million dollars to actually remove the ramp. I'd love to see these two projects connected, but I'm not getting the full picture here. Well, I think the, the, the thing that we're waiting on is still, uh, Darren is currently working with the uh, person, uh, the firm that submitted the proposal for the river ramp property, and I don't think he's to the point where he's ready to determine whether that can move forward or not, and we're hopeful that, that it can and that we can continue to progress over the next six months with our design. Okay. Um, but uh, as far as I know, that's still moving forward. I do anticipate that that's going to be a positive outcome for the city, but the exact details, I'm, I'm not really close to that project. Other questions? If not, thank you very much, gentlemen. Next, an event center update. Director Cotter. Good afternoon, Council Chair and Councilors. Thank you for the opportunity to give you this update today. Um, a lot's taken place in the last month with the Event Center. Today you'll hear from Dan Mills with Mortensen Construction, Don Defliffs from St. Combs Defliffs, Jeff Hazard with Coke Hazard, Tracy Turback, Director of Finance, and Mayor Mike Huther. Um, we're going to start with today that you'll hear an update from Dan, Don, and Jeff on how we've leveraged local professionals to get a good uh, schematic design cost estimate, also what those project elements are, and how this building is unique to Sioux Falls. Tracy Turback will uh, provide again a focus on the financing plan, and Mayor Huther will close and field questions. So we'll get started. We have a brief presentation, and we'll start with uh, Mortensen Construction, Dan Mills. Uh, thank you, Mark, Madam Chair, members of the Council. I just thought I'd give you a few brief words about our process for assembling the uh, schematic design estimate and how we included uh, the contractors from the local community. 
and I'm going to press the magic button, and there we go. So um, the design team is going to talk about the design of the building here in a minute, but first um, just wanted to go through um, our inclusiveness program. Um, when we both, when we originally uh, interviewed for the project, we presented our approach to a project like this, which is a very, very large project for the community. It's a community, community involvement is very important in the project, uh, especially as it pertains to the contractors and the vendors and so forth. And we're accustomed to um, setting up a project so that the local contractors have the opportunity to compete for the work and to build the work. The role Mortensen plays on the project is to provide overview or oversight of the project relative to quality of the, of the construction, relative to the safety, to provide guaranteed delivery on cost, on schedule, and to carry the design intent um, that we have through the design process through construction. And then we assemble the project so that it can be bid in, in packages that are the right size for the community contractors to build it. And uh, the slide up there shows uh, the success we've had in other communities with this same delivery model. Uh, Iowa State University, the Alara Center in Grand Forks, Kinnick Stadium for the University of Iowa, the DEC Arena in Duluth, and, and many other examples show that we've been able to have local contractors build anywhere from 80% as high as 96% of the project. And on a sports facility, there are certain elements of the project that just can't be done locally. Uh, long span roof trusses, seats, and so forth, you know, need to, need to come from more of, a, more of the region. So as we um, put together the schematic estimate, uh, we sent out over 300 letters to contractors requesting their input. And uh, many, many local contractors uh, called back and said, yes, we would love to help. Uh, we first, Mortensen, did a full quantity takeoff of the drawings, and we provided those quantities to the contractors. And we got input from site work contractors, uh, concrete foundation steel contractors, HVAC plumbing and electrical contractors, interior contractors, furniture fixture and equipment contractors, and sound system scoreboard contractors. And they all were um, interested in providing cost information, which is very, very important because it gives us a flavor for the current market. And it's very important to understand what the current market costs are as opposed to just going back to historical database. So we got all that information. But what was interesting um, through that process was the reaction from the contractors. And so um, what we did is we assembled some of the, the uh, quotes and comments that we received from the local contractors. They were very appreciative and thankful for the opportunity to participate in a project such as this relative to budgeting. Um, and they were very excited about the opportunity that this project brings to the community to um, the workforce, to their families, to their businesses. And um, so what I did is I took all of those quotes and tried to summarize it into kind of one, you know, capturing comment. Um, the local contracting community sees this project as a tremendous opportunity for their industry, and I just felt important to, to share that with you. But um, now for a little more exciting stuff, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Don Deathlefs with Sinkholm Deathlefs, and they were going to go through and, and give you an overview of the design of the building itself. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. I'm Don Deathlefs, CEO of Sinkholm's Deathlefs. Um, basically, what we've done is we've worked very closely with Dan and Mortensen to, to look at the pricing and the features that are in the building. And what we've tried to do, just like he has worked with the local subcontractors and contractors, we've done the same with our design team. I think, as I told you before, 50% of the design fees on this project are going to be local to Sioux Falls, and we're really collaborating and sharing that. So I'm going to have Jeff Hazard come up in a second and tell you what makes this a aesthetically and some of the features uniquely Sioux Falls. But also what we've done from the very beginning is to try to um, develop an event center that will energize the fans but also have the maximum economic impact to the community. It's kind of what we based it on. So sometimes people have said, how does this vary from competing facilities or the existing arena? And the first thing we want to say is what we are going to have are more amenities and more spaces for circulation, better things as we told you before for restrooms, more um, food service amenities. There will be a probably a wider choice of price 
price ranges in the building. Uh, the fact that we are adding significantly more seats allows some areas to have even less expensive seats than we would have in the current arenas and others to help generate revenue such as club seats, suites, those will be all integrated and those are usually integrated and have been very successful to the finances of current event centers around the country. So we think that is very important. What we're trying to do in this uh, package for the 115 million that is being proposed is to provide a lot of amenities and not just seats. You can do one of these buildings with just have seats without a lot of the bells and whistles that will help it uh, live for the next 50 to 100 years. So that's what we've been concentrating. As we told you before, what we are also doing is making it a much larger facility. As we said, it's going to be 12,000 seats for basketball. So that will allow you to attract large tournaments um, and larger events. And if we can do that, those are the kind of events that will bring more people to Sioux Falls and have a greater economic impact. So we go from 12,000 for basketball up to 10,450 for hockey and 13,000 for center stage. Those are all key events. At the same time, we have the home teams that need a much smaller capacity, so we've been working very closely with them to enhance the building for their use as well to make sure that this building is a great improvement for them as well. We have curtaining systems where we can downsize it and create intimate sight lines, and we think that's very important. Uh, the last one I want to bring up is the end stage. I think we've told you before, by creating this modified U-shaped seating bowl, what we are able to do is get 11,850 seats for the end stage. We get just a few less when we do the 90 degree curtaining, and basically a lot of shows now, big concerts, country and rock and pop, are traveling with a curtain system in front. And what we've done is a very large seating section on the end so we can pull the whole stage back. So what that does is it adds about 1,500 seats in front of the stage than if we hadn't done the design in this manner. So what it's going to be able to do is bring much bigger concerts to Sioux Falls and hopefully more events to the community as, in, 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 as compared to if we had designed the building differently. The last big things I want to mention is the floor. The current arena does not have an 85 by 200 foot floor. It's smaller than average and the entire arena business is set up on the 85 by 200, that's the NHL, NHL sized ice rink, but it also does circus, arena soccer, arena lacrosse, arena football. It's the whole nature of the touring industry is set up on this 85 by 200. So already by this building we'll have a standard floor as a baseline. Then what we're doing is we're having a number of retractable seats uh, six rows on each side so we can get 120 feet across which is perfect for a trade show layout so what we're going to be able to do is just that floor alone is another 35,000 square feet and probably the biggest tenant of this building is going to be the CVB and what they're going to be able to do for the first time is bring in much larger events because we have this floor but also we also have the option now of doing more smaller events because we'll have the current convention center the current arena and the new event center and they can either be combined or we can have different events happening in different buildings. So we're adding thousands of square feet for the trade show use and as well as on the concourses and on this floor. We think that's very important. Also for the first time in the same configuration where we pull those seats back, you'll have a much larger floor for special events such as rodeos, equestrian events, the big tire events, motocross, which are severely restricted in the current arena. So we've tried to, you know, within our budget and within what we've had um, as our design goals, to design a building that will maximize the potential for events and bring more people to town, which we think is greatly going to enhance the economics of the building. Now I want to have Jeff Hazard come up and talk about how we've made this uniquely Sioux Falls. Thanks, Don. Uh, Jeff Hazard, Coke Hazard Architects. Uh, there are, are a number of things we're trying to do, ranging from the obvious to the pretty subtle all of which, of course, are you know, cost effective, um, to make this building unique to Sioux Falls, to, to ground it in our community. Um, they range from uh, the incorporation of prairie landscape elements, native plantings, 
like uh, prairie grasses and uh, native perennials in the uh, forecourt in the in the four plaza of the of the event center to local streetscape elements um, we're thinking of uh, the sort of surrounds of the planting areas being similar to those in the downtown area along Phillips Avenue and on 8th Street that, that you know sort of are, are becoming sort of iconic of, of Sioux Falls pedestrian spaces. We're looking at the incorporation of quartzite stone in a number of ways, um, including in the lighting bollards in that entry plaza, which are those uh, elements that are about waist high that would be made of quartzite with lights on top to provide good illumination of the of the plaza. Uh, as well, the plaza would be a colored concrete that is quartzite colored and of course contains quartzite. And then, then as we move into the building, um, sorry, this slide's a little bit dark, but on the tick, just the face of the ticket um, selling booth would be a sort of a polished quartzite. At least that's what we're currently thinking. That sort of looking at ways that we can use quartzite in a variety of ways in very controlled quantities um, to you know ground the, the building in, in the community. Um, then as we move into the lobby, um, you, we're proposing to extend the terrazzo paving from the uh, conference center, from the convention center, into the lobby of the, of the event center, just, just into that first floor area to create continuity between the convention center and the event center. We're proposing a uh, quartzite again on the lower portion of that massive wall that acts as kind of an anchor on, on each side of the event center. Uh, we're proposing the use of limited quantities of prairie materials like wheat board or sorghum board, things that are made from the byproducts of our you know, food industry in this part of the country. Um, and those are, those are indicated in the sort of some of the ceiling panels that, would, that we would uh, propose to have on the, in the south lobby and concourse areas of the building. There are some there's the possibility of some evocative wall graphics. I mean, wall graphics can be a very inexpensive way to, to, to make a wall surface, and there are some expansive wall surfaces in this building interesting. Um, wall graphics can include things like history information about Sioux Falls, could include sports information, could include information about events in the, in, uh, that would happen in the building. It could include information about other attractions in Sioux Falls so that you know, once people come to this facility, they find out about all the other things that they can do in Sioux Falls. There are some very subtle um, architectural uh, references like the, the horizontality of the exterior expression, all those horizontal windows that uh, sort of are uh, inspired by the, the sort of vast um, horizontal horizontality of the plane, sort of the subtle curves in the building that are inspired by that sort of, you know, the, the uh, subtle hills as we approach the river, the cascading stairs, um, also kind of a reference to the, to the falls of the Sioux River. Then there's just the, you know, making available views of, of uh, important Sioux Falls um, icons like the cathedral or Elmwood Golf Course. Just the way the building is designed, the, all of the concessions and the restrooms are pushed in under the uh, seating bowl so that uh, the circulation is around the perimeter and so we can have windows from the concourses looking out over the you know views of Sioux Falls. I think there's a we tried to make a thoughtful connection with the convention center. The mullions and the windows and the horizontal uh, quartzite elements relate to the actually to the window mullions in the in the uh, uh, convention center windows on the south side there. And then there are some completely non-architectural things uh, to keep in mind, like the naming of the building and some of the spaces within the building will presumably be um, Sioux Falls or, you know, related names. Uh, some of the clubs and loges could be named you know, with creative names that relate to Sioux Falls and, and help uh, you know, establish a sense of pride among uh, the community as, it, as they're attending the facility, uh, events at the facility. And then the advertising, you know, the, we have the, uh, the ribbon board around the, around the perimeter of the seating bowl and the, 
and the uh, scoreboards you know, will have advertising and the advertising will be local. I mean, those are obviously non-architectural, but they're, all of those things are, will contribute to uh, the event center feeling like it's a part of the Sioux Falls community. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tracy to talk about the financing. Good afternoon, Council Chair, members of the Council, Tracy Turback with the Finance Office. Of course, there's no aspect of any project more exciting than the financing and the money, right? I don't have any nice pictures of the facility to show you, but uh, we, can, we can talk dollars and cents for sure. As we began the project, or the, developing the, the financing plan for this project last winter, we really identified four primary goals or elements that we wanted to make part of the financing plan to uh, maximize the chances of ultimate success uh, of this project. Those four fundamental elements that, that we wanted to incorporate into the financing plan include, uh, number one, do not increase taxes. Number two, minimize the impact to other planned capital projects for the city. Number three, find a way for those who will benefit to contribute financially to the project. And then last, do no harm to the city's strong financial position. I'd like to spend just a minute or two on each one of those four fundamental elements. Number one, do not increase taxes. And you've heard me say this before, and I'll continue to say it. Uh, the, uh, the financing plan, as proposed, includes no new taxes, no increase to existing taxes to pay for any element of this project, not for construction, not for debt service, not for operational costs. Furthermore, no property tax revenues or first penny sales tax revenues will be used for this project in any way. In fact, no general fund revenues will go toward the project in any way, shape, or form. The revenues from property taxes and first penny sales taxes will continue to go to the city general fund to fund those fundamental services that the public expects the city to provide, like police and fire protection, like library services, street maintenance, snow removal, parks and recreational facilities, and those types of, of essential services. Bottom line on, on this fundamental element is that taxpayers will not be asked to pay any more than they're already paying. And that's really a, a kind of a remarkable element to uh, get this far along in a project and be able to say that. As you look around uh, at other facilities that are like this that are constructed uh, very few, if any, are able to, to accomplish the project without implementing a new form of tax or increasing taxes in, in some way, shape, or form. And, and so I think that really speaks to the, uh, the, uh, the part of the country we live in, the state that we live in, and the community that we live in. The second uh, fundamental element or goal that we, we wanted to achieve in, in developing the financing plan is to minimize the impact to other planned projects. And that's one of the reasons that we utilize bond financing for long-term projects. By utilizing bond financing, we can spread the costs out over many years. And, and in this case, this is a, a very significant project. Uh, by sp spreading the cost of the event center out over many years, we can allow this project to be achieved without disrupting existing plans for other capital projects. In fact, the five-year capital plan that's currently under consideration by the City Council increases the investment of second penny sales tax dollars in other projects beyond the amounts included in the five-year plan adopted just last fall. The recommended five-year plan invests more second penny sales tax dollars in streets, in parks and recreational facilities, and in other city facilities. One other thing I'd like to mention is since the, the major rainstorm that we had last month, some have questioned why the city would be spending money on an event center when our sewer system needs improvements. And it's important to point out that, that the improvements that the sanitary sewer system needs will continue. Funding is already in place to make those improvements, and those projects 
are progressing. The event center project and the financing for the event center will have no impact on the city's ability to uh, proceed with those improvements to the sanitary sewer system. Two additional key features of the event center financing plan that make it possible to eliminate impacts to other planned projects are, are these. First of all, we have two prior bond issues that will be paid off in the near future. <clears throat> we are currently are utilizing over $5 million in second penny sales tax money each year to make payments on those two bond issues. So as those two bond issues are retired, that will free up a significant amount of money that can go toward the debt service payments on this new bond issue for the event center. The second key element of, uh, that, that makes it possible for us to uh, finance the event center without negatively impacting other planned projects is the portion of anticipated very modest growth in sales tax revenues that will be used to make bond payments uh, on the event center bonds. The third fundamental element of our financing plan, those who will benefit must contribute. Again, that's another reason why we bond long-term projects. Certainly an argument can be made that the entire community will benefit from a project like this. It will certainly uh, undoubtedly increase economic activity. Uh, and when, when the uh, Sioux Falls economy prospers, we all benefit. And with the increased economic activity, the city coffers uh, are enhanced as well as higher tax revenues go to support uh, other essential city services. The generation of residents and visitors to Sioux Falls who will benefit from the event center over the next 25 or 30 years or longer is also the generation that will be contributing second penny sales tax dollars to pay off those bonds. The cost to operate and maintain the event center, of course, will go on long after the bonds have been paid off for as long as the facility is used. 30, 40, 50 years. I think I heard somebody say 100 years a little bit ago. Well, that might be stretching it a little bit, but who knows? The businesses that pay for the naming rights or advertising or sponsorships for the event center facility will certainly realize a benefit from the exposure that, uh, that they will receive from this facility. It's certainly appropriate that those dollars that are generated uh, from those businesses go to fund the ongoing operational costs of the facility. Likewise, it's certainly appropriate that the revenues generated from suite leases and other premium seating goes to pay for the ongoing operating costs. <clears throat> Organizations that use the facility, people that buy tickets and attend events there, will certainly contribute significantly toward paying for the ongoing operational cost of the event center. The projections that have been developed indicate that the revenues from all of the direct users of the facility, including the individuals and businesses that are advertising and buying sponsorships and naming rights, are expected to be sufficient to pay the ongoing operating costs of the event center. Now there are no guarantees, of course, that the facility will operate in the black, but the good faith projections that have been developed indicate that the results will be positive. The fourth fundamental element of the financing plan, do no harm to the city's strong financial position. You folks and, and the public hear time and time again that the city is in strong financial condition, and that is a fact. Sioux Falls is not Washington, D.C. We do business a lot differently here than they do in Washington. We're all frustrated. I'm frustrated with what I see happening in, in Washington, D.C. And the, and the way our, our uh, federal government manages its money. It's important to not paint the city of Sioux Falls with the same broad brush used to paint the federal government. The city of Sioux Falls has no general obligation debt. That in and of itself is, is a remarkable thing. The city only borrows money when investing in the long-term future of the community, like for an event center. The financial strength of the city is, is recognized in the independent bond rating. Just last year when the city refinanced some sales tax bonds, we received a, an excellent bond rating of AA2 from Moody's Investors. Throughout the economic challenges of the recent years, the city of Sioux Falls has maintained solid general fund reserves 
well above the city's council, the city council's policy of 25% of budgeted expenditures. The event center project will have absolutely zero impact on the status of the city general fund reserves. No general fund dollars will be used for the project. Rating agencies typically like to see pledged revenues of no less than one and a half times the amount of required bond payments. Some time ago, the Sioux Falls City Council went one better than the bond rating agencies and established a policy <clears throat> maintaining pledged reserves, or requiring pledged reserves of no less than two times the amount of bond payments. Under the event center financing plan, that is uh, the established policy of maintaining pledged reserves, excuse me, under the event center financing plan, the bond payments will we remain well within the council's policy on debt service coverage. And again, you've heard me say this before, uh, but it again bears repeating, I think. The per capita debt for the city of Sioux Falls is comparatively low and will remain so when we compare to other peer communities, even with the event center bonds uh, included in the calculation, we compare very, very favorably to our peer communities. So the results of our plan, uh, we started out with those four elements as, as goals that we wanted to incorporate into the plan and, and I believe we've achieved that with the plan that, that's proposed uh, in, in all four instances. I believe we meet or exceed those primary elements. There are, are no increased taxes included in the financing plan. There, are no, there will be no impact to other planned capital projects. Those who will benefit from the event center will contribute financially to the event center. And the city's strong financial position will be maintained. With that, I will turn it over to Mayor Huther to close the presentation. Thank you. Council Chair Aguilar, uh, many times over the last year has reiterated to me, Mayor, before we are going to move forward on this event center, you have to gain the confidence and trust of the city council. Tracy Turback, in his last presentation, was trying to do that once again. Tonight's a big, big night. It's one of the biggest nights uh, in, our, in our city's history. And all of you will certainly be engaged in what's uh, going to take place. I had uh, breakfast with uh, one of the leaders in our community, uh, President Rob Oliver of Augustana College, uh, last week. We were talking about all kinds of things, and, and of course, we were talking about the, what was happening in D.C., and of course, this event center. And uh, certainly we knew that there were some challenges not only around the country, but maybe even some challenges right here in Sioux Falls. President Oliver relayed something to me, and I wrote it down on a napkin. He said, you know what, Mike? He goes, when you tackle big projects, when you tackle big things in life, generally you're more and more successful the more confident that you are. Rob looked at me and he said, Mayor, it's all about confidence. It is. It's been a good road uh, that, that this team of city council members and, and this mayor have have been on. We've learned a lot. It hasn't always been fun. But I think we've come a long, long way in this project, and, and I commend you for your diligence uh, along the way. But I do believe that it is certainly a time for confidence uh, when it comes to this project. Uh, and, and I believe the people of Sioux Falls have a much more confident uh, feeling about this project than they did certainly a year ago, and uh, all of you should be commended for that. Uh, I don't know all the people of Sioux Falls, and I haven't engaged them all in this project, but we have talked about things like polls and, and uh, what we're hearing at listening and learning sessions and, and on and on and on. Well, as you know, there was a poll that was just recently done, and um, it wasn't done by me. It wasn't done by the council. It was done by two trustworthy organizations here in Sioux Falls, Kel Land and the Artist Leader. They had hired a firm called Mason Dixon Polling and Research. And uh, they asked a question of uh, some folks here in Sioux Falls. Uh, do you support or oppose having the city of Sioux Falls build a new event center to replace the arena? 
The results of this poll are no different than the ones that have, we've talked about before. I talked about the poll that I did during my campaign. We talked about the poll that Kel Lan, Argus leader, did uh, prior to this one. We talked about the Nielsen Brothers poll, and once again, we're talking about the people of Sioux Falls, the voters of Sioux Falls, and what they're believing right now. I, heck, I think they're confident. I think they see the need. I think they trust you. I think they're trusting the administration. And I think they're ready to move forward as a city. Uh, we've talked many, many times, especially in the beginning, about how let's let the people decide. Ultimately, only you will be able to uh, decide on that. I'm not taking for granted at all that you folks are going to allow the people of Sioux Falls to vote on this project. But um, if you do, if you do, we're not going to take anything for granted, City Council. We're not going to take anything for granted in terms of uh, believing that this thing is a done deal. If you do decide tonight to allow the people of Sioux Falls an opportunity to vote, we will start an education and information effort uh, even bigger than what we've done before. There could be a potential vote on November 8th. If that vote is successful, if we have 50% plus one that vote yes on that, we could have our potential groundbreaking for this new event center that you've heard so much about in the fall of 2012. And Sioux Falls can be reaping the rewards and reaping the benefits of that investment by the fall of 2014. The potential to have our ribbon cutting in the fall of 2014 is real. I'm confident. I believe the people of Sioux Falls is confident, uh, are, are confident, and I believe most of you, if not all of you, are certainly confident as well. We want to thank you for your time again today. Uh, we brought in the big guns one more time for you because this is such an important night for our city. Uh, we'd like to answer any and all questions that you may have. Questions for the mayor or any of the others that presented this afternoon? Councillor Wolfing. Oh, Councillor Jameson. If I could start off with maybe something we haven't talked much about. Uh, First off, I have a list of questions, but I'll just start off softly. Who are we going to be competing with when we build this event center? Are we hoping to draw everybody who would normally go to a concert in Sioux City? Would they come to Sioux Falls? Because I, I'm just, just give me a second here. I'm trying to understand who we hope to capture and would a concert promoter go to Sioux City and Sioux Falls, or would he pick between us? I think that's what we would want for them to pick between us so that the people from Sioux City had to come to Sioux Falls. Is that what you're envisioning and hoping? Hey, Councilor Jameson, I'm not an expert in terms of booking concerts or rodeos or special events. And, uh, but I think the, just, again, speaking only for myself and, and maybe some of the, the business acumen that I bring to the office, I think the very first thing we want to try to capture is a lost opportunity that we're, that we're not capturing today. I think as uh, uh, you've heard from the folks at Global Spectrum and, and uh, folks like that, as, long as, as well as Terry Ellis Schmidt uh, with CVB, there are opportunities that we can't even go after today because we don't have the facilities to, uh, to handle those, those projects or those events or those concerts or those rodeos. So I think that's the first thing that we'll be able to right. take advantage of there. And then in terms of competing, um, I, that's, that's, the, that's the great thing about business and it's the great thing about this industry is that, yes, we'll certainly be competing uh, against other um, facilities that, that have um, the ability to, to capture concerts or, or events like this. And so, yes, I do see us competing against uh, whether it be um, Sioux City or, or Rapid City or places like that, I, I do in, probably envision that happening. But again, only the concert promoter along with uh, the folks at uh, uh, Spectrum or, or Global, Global Spectrum or, or SMG, uh, Terry L. Schmidt and others, I think they'd be best uh, uh, able to respond to that. I didn't see Terry in the audience. I see Scott. But I, if Scott could help, maybe I'm not sure. But the idea is 
I just feel like we should have this thing figured out. I, I see us competing with Sioux City completely. I mean, Sioux City does not want us to build this. I think we all have heard that. We can appreciate that. And the convenience of us being able to go right here instead of driving to Sioux City for George Strait or whoever. I'm just concerned that we don't have it figured out enough that if George Strait is coming through the area and he wants to make 50 grand no matter what happens, when he leaves the event center, he, he gets a check for 50 grand. Now, Sioux City has a distinct competitive advantage over us because they've got their facility paid off, as I understand it. Certainly they have a subsidy to operate the building, but we would have a tremendous debt load for 20 years. We will not be able to fully compete until our 20-year debt service is done. So I, I'm just wondering if we're going big enough to draw everybody in that would still go to Sioux City, but then we also get the people who would go from Omaha Sioux Falls to Fargo. We fill that big gap. I just don't feel comfortable that we've got our size convinced to me that we're doing the right size to compete with our biggest competitor, Sioux City. And I, and I don't know if Scott can help. Or, Mayor, you decide, whoever you like. I know Scott's in a different spot now. No. But if Terry was here, but if you can answer, or even some of the experts here, that well, would be helpful to me. Councilor Jensen, again, this is, uh, we've talked about, you know, size, and we've talked about a variety of things for a number of months. I, uh, we, did, we did hire the experts to help us along this journey. Uh, we've talked about, should it be 10,000 seats, 12,000 seats, 15,000 seats? Uh, we talked about it during our part in the journey, as well as the last task force talked about it as well. Uh, and the 12,000 seats was the was the recommended size. Um, I will respectfully disagree with something that you, you said in terms of not having the ability to compete until it's paid for. I, I, I respectfully disagree. We'll compete in a very, very aggressive fashion the day, uh, the day that we break ground. Uh, well, actually, I, we'll compete aggressively. No, let, me, let me take that back. We'll compete aggressively the day after this thing is voted on, uh, voted yes. That's November 9th. Uh, we will be competing against people all over this country to book events in our city versus others effective on November 9th. Uh, I think that Terry L. Schmidt and others have said that, uh, that, that when we get the go-ahead to build this new facility, she will have a, uh, a different level of strength, different bargaining ability to make good things happen for our city. I'll share the time, okay. Chair, if you'd like to pass it around. Councilor Brown. I do have some questions on the payments. Uh, the first two years are interest only, 4.6, 4.9, and then they go to, in the following years, 5.9, 6.9, 7.9. After those first two years of interest only, why is it not a level payment going uh, forward? It was part of the, the strategy of, of utilizing the growth in our sales tax revenues to meet those payments. So and, we structured it that way then? Right. And, and that's certainly something that is, is not etched in stone. I mean, the, the plan is flexible. We can change that if there's some advantage to changing it. The other, the other reason it stepped up incrementally is to coincide with those other bond issues paying off. So as we no longer need dollars to go toward paying off those old bonds, we can increase our payment on the event center bonds. Okay. And then now that the, the price tag is, is $115 million, really $125 million with the issuance of bonds, what impact is that going to have on the next CIP plan? Because obviously it was structured with a cost of $110 million. Right. If we add uh, another $5 million to the, the cost of the project and – uh, presumably issue another $5 million in bonds and then what those numbers are based on. Uh, we would have to revisit the, the, the scheduling on those payments. Uh, one, one alternative that we would look at would be to extend the term rather than 22 years, make it 23 years. $5 million more in the bond issue spread out over 20 years is not going to have an insurmountable impact to the annual payments that we make. There is some flex as well in the numbers that are in the plan in terms of interest rates. We made some assumptions. They are they're based on uh, assumed interest rates that are higher than rates are currently. Of course, we don't know 
uh, what rates will be when the time comes to issue bonds, and that's the reason we built some flexibility in there. And bond issuance again would happen at what point if the vote November 8th happens? What month would we the go? The actual to bond market? issuance? Well, that would remain to be, be determined yet. I mean, obviously, we would want to, uh, if we're going to proceed expeditiously, we would want to want to issue bonds as soon as we could. Uh, it could easily take 60 days following an election to have all the pieces in place. It could take longer. Um, we don't want to be in a position where we have to issue bonds on, on a certain date or within a very narrow window of time. Again, it's important to maintain flexibility on that, and that's, that's all part of working out the schedule, the bond issuance schedule uh, with our bond uh, council as well as our financial advisory firm. And I think we, you and I talked about this before, but we talk about competitive bonds, not negotiated, correct? That's certainly the, the preference that the city has shown in the past. Um, again, that's something we would rely on our financial advisory firm to, to provide some, some advice on that. Um, typically, the more plain vanilla, uh, generic a bond issue is, the more it lends itself to a competitive sale, and this would be a very straightforward bond sale in my, in my view. So I, I would expect it would likely come down to a, a competitive bond sale. Um, but it's, it's really too early to make a final decision on that. And then I had a question from a constituent that I, I couldn't answer the question. He asked, why not a general ob obligation bond? Uh, I, I assume the answer is only that it, it requires 60% of the vote other than 50%, but there are, are there other reasons why we would not do a, a general obligation bond? Well, that, that is one reason why uh, a general obligation bond is, is more difficult because it does require 60% approval. And, and the reason, uh, I believe the reason that's in the law is that a general obligation bond typically is repaid with revenues generated from a special property tax. So, in effect, you do increase taxes ordinarily when you do a general obligation bond. Okay. And we wouldn't be able to do that, obviously, without an opt-out, correct? Well, the, by voting, by virtue of voting 60 percent approval or more, uh, that would, would essentially give you your opt-out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councillor Erpenbach. Thank you. Um, Tracy, can you stay up there for a second, please? I'm looking at, sli at the slide that's, I don't know what number it is, but it starts with element number one, do not increase taxes. It's the, your third slide in the financing segment, I'm sorry. We've talked about this over and over again. I, I understand you're, you're repeating the message so that we get it, we drill it into our brains. What I want to understand now is, is um, when we say we're not going to create any new taxes, aren't we taxing the people of Sioux Falls as far as the state will allow us at this point we have the full second penny we have, we've done all of those things are we not at the point where we couldn't create new taxes except to opt out and do a new property tax right and right? I, I believe I've mentioned that we that's one option we don't have even if we wanted to we couldn't create right. a new tax and and so then the second point then no tax increase talks about the second penny which again we've we've t tapped it out and then I guess the no property tax line is confusing to me because we are, and we have to, Councilor Brown and I talked about it today, we have to take an increase in property taxes this year. It is only inflationary, it's about 2.5%, but in order to keep up with all those expenses of running city government, we do have to, to raise the property tax that little bit. So I'm not sure that we're being completely honest when we use those three statements. And then if I could, one other question on can, the... Can I, excuse me, can yeah, I go ahead. respond to that? Yes. The event center will have no effect on property taxes. The, in, the increase that you're referring to in property taxes, those additional dollars that come in will not be utilized for the event center, not for construction, not for debt service, not for operations. And that's, I mean, the, the presentation deals specifically with financing the event center, right, not, exactly. not with police department or fire service, those things. Right, exactly. And I want people to understand that the, the property taxes are going up just a little bit, or is, assuming the vote goes the way that we think it will but it's not, not about the event center. Correct. Then my other question is about on slide six in the finance presentation. Again, element number four is what it starts with. And this one I didn't, I just flat out didn't understand what you were saying. One, two, three, four. The fifth point down, the bond payments will be well within the council's debt service coverage policy. And you said that our coverage policy is two times the payments, the bond payment. Correct. If I were, and I am, a regular citizen, where would I find that information if I'm looking through the budget or the, through the CIP or the debt payments or whatever? Where am I going to find that particular debt service 
coverage piece for this? Where does that sit in the? That, I don't know that it appears anywhere uh, explicitly in the budget document that the council approves. I mean, it's a calculation that's done uh, based on revenue projections and projected uh, future debt service payments. So I mean, it's 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 a, a projection that encompasses the entire lifetime of the bonds. Okay, good. Thank you. Then if I might, Council Chair, I do have a question about ballot language. Is this an appropriate time or would that be another time? Go forward. My question then, based on the conversation I just had with Tracy about the slide that says element number one, so I want to look at the ballot language that's on our agenda tonight. Oh, I've forgotten what item it is. Seven, I believe. I want to look at that, the, um, um, the structure of the ballot. Um, put, it says official municipal ele special election ballot. It says instruction to the voter, fill in the circle, blah, blah, blah. And then there are three paragraphs of information where in the second paragraph says there will be no new taxes, no increase in property taxes, and no increase in sales tax rates authorized by the current city council to pay for the project. I'm concerned, and I, I am making a statement, I apologize, I'm concerned that that is um, misleading to the voters. And the other piece of it for me then is that I didn't understand this ballot. It doesn't look like a ballot I've ever voted before, and I, I have been voting for a while. I have voted on on uh, you know special elections before and so I asked staff I finally it, it just wasn't sinking in for me today and so I asked staff to look it up for me and there is administrative rules that describe how a ballot looks in the state of South Dakota for municipal elections and I asked them to make copies for me and so I'm going to hand these out these again are administrative administrative rules and it outlines what a ballot is supposed to look like and we've just about got it except for those three paragraphs after the fill in the circle and before the line proposition to build an event center. Yeah. And so I know this was written by a committee, but I don't agree with it and I don't believe it fits the policies and, and the, the administrative rule cites state law that outlines how, what a ballot's supposed to look like. And so I guess my question is, can we make that change? Can we take that out? And then if we can, I, I would ask that my, my colleagues vote with me tonight, because I, I do want to amend that out be, based on the administrative rules. So not really a very good question, but Mr. Attorney, if you might. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, Councilor Erpenbach, regarding your first question on the second paragraph, that there will be no new taxes, et cetera, that is modifying the last clause to pay for the project. So I think that is totally accurate, that there are not going to be any increase in property taxes to pay for the project. As far as the ballot language goes, there was a state statute that was repealed in 2006 that called for the way in which one could, uh, a municipality, excuse me, could uh, present a question to the voters. That left a vacuum. There are two administrative rules that are dealing with similar type of issues, but not exactly on point. So I have checked, certainly with our bond council, who has, uh, who is Doug Hayek, as well as Perkins Coie, as well as a couple of the attorneys on the state election uh, board, as well as done my own research. And it is up in the air in terms of how the ballot question can be presented. There is no set format. Uh, this form, as you indicated, was uh, something that was worked out with uh, an election and ballot language committee. Uh, the committee, I think, reached a consensus that this was appropriate language. And certainly it was modeled off some other elections that have been conducted. I believe Bond Council in particular was using the three paragraphs that you're referencing prior to the proposition. That was something that was done in some other uh, similar type elections. So I hope that answers your question. If I, if I might just continue then, what's the point of the little commercial before the question when you also then have the attorney's opinion afterwards? I mean, it really is, it's a sales pitch. I mean, realistically, look at those three paragraphs. It's a sales pitch. Please vote yes. It's a really good idea. Here's the question. And then the attorney's explanation. Is there value does it make it more fair if that little bit isn't there? 
I, th I think the goal of the committee and certainly of, of bond council, Council Erpenbach, was to kind of preface the actual proposition with further explanation. Uh, it's been found that, you know, sometimes uh, one may not want to go through all the attorney explanation and at least have a concise statement prior to the proposition so that the voters are informed what's going on. I think that was the goal of, of the committee in reaching that. Anyone from the committee have comments? I don't remember who was on that. I was one of the members of the committee, uh, also with Vernon Brown, and Greg Jamison joined us later on, uh, but was extremely helpful in uh, the verbiage of both the attorney's explanation and the other two paragraphs. And exactly uh, what the question was, was that we wanted to make sure that the people understood exactly what was going to be used in the financing of this. And where we talk about no new property taxes, once again, no new property taxes for this project, where the property tax that we're going to be discussing is just a general property tax that the state allows us to do almost yearly. Last year there was, no, there was none. So I feel that you know we've, we've gone over this several times. We've changed the verbiage. Uh, when Councilman Jameson came in, he had several recommendations also that uh, I believe we've worked into this. And I think it is uh, the best compromise between the group of uh, determining exactly what the ballot language was going to be. And I fully support this. Councilor Jameson. I would like to add just that the way it kind of got started was I got brought into the meeting uh, because Councilor Brown could make a meeting, and so I got involved in it. And my nose in it, I suppose. My intentions were to initially include the words issue bonds right in the question. So the question would read whether the city of Sioux Falls should issue bonds to build a multi purpose event center. And we had a discussion about that. The paragraph that was above it before, in all fairness, probably was a little more of a marketing piece. And what the compromise was, was let's not put those words issue bonds in the actual language of the question. Let's include an explanation of what's actually going to happen. Because prior to this, it did not have a, I don't think, a fair explanation of exactly that the council was still going to have to act and vote to issue these bonds as well that the, uh, that's where the money was going to be coming from. So we were, our attempt was to neutralize the sales pitch a little bit with just the facts. Uh, I think it does that, but you know, perhaps uh, certainly up to the group if they want to change it or do whatever they'd like. The committee, the committee did uh, feel comfortable with the words here. I, would, I think we could still do better with having the words issue bonds right in the actual language, but I'm willing to compromise and, and you know, make things work, so I think that's what happened. Any other comments? Councilor um, Entman. Close. Sorry. <laughs> it's those E's. They both would start with an E, yeah. Um, reading through the language. Uh, the language is very simplistic. It's very simple and it's easy to understand. And quite honestly, I don't think it's going to be confusing at all for a person that gets up there and reads through this, as a lot of people do at the beginning of any election. A lot of times, the only time they read through what's actually going to be on the ballot is the day they get in line to vote on it unfortunately and hopefully that will not be the case here but if you read this language it's very simple it's easy to understand and I approve the language the way it's stated here Councillor Brown actually just a question for uh, some of the committee members because I did ask that we test this with some voters too and I don't if it was sent to us I don't remember what the results were that um, Kendra are you able to help us with that um, we tested it on different age levels, demographics of, of regular voters, and what were the results of right. that? Kendra Simmonsma from the mayor's office. We sent out the ballot language as it stands with just some minor tweaks um, to eight business laymen. Um, Councilor Brown offered four from SDN. I chose two representatives uh, that I knew in a different demographic. 
from CNA Surety and Midland National Salmon's Financial Group, and then just um, some colleagues out of Vera McKinnon. And the, all the comments that came back were easy to understand. All the SDN, not to expose your anonymity, was easy to understand, no changes. The, there were some questions about the attorney's language, and now the, some of the language wasn't as clear attorney, how attorney language can be. <laughs> but there was nothing substantial that came back. And my apologies, Councilor Brown, I did not send out the exact um, comments back from the eight individuals. It wasn't, I wasn't expecting it, Kendra. I just, uh, I figured that if, if we hadn't heard from you, there were no major issues with it. Thank you. That's correct. Councilor Jamison. At least on this topic, the, uh, you know, I would certainly ask the question as, as it was, as I proposed it, does the group feel that if we included the words issue bonds to build a multi-purpose event center, would that be too confusing? Would that be too much to add? Initially, I had started with that request, and I was kind of uh, shot, shot down on that idea, but certainly it's up to us. It's, if that's a revision we'd like to make, it's one that I think is actually uh, makes the language crystal clear. So, just a thought. Councillor Anderson, Jr. And on that, uh, when we did question the bond council on that, Councilman Jamison, that did come back with the, remember that we asked the bond council's uh, opinion on that, and they did come back with saying that that wasn't something that should be on there. I think that was at our second meeting where we wanted an explanation from the bond council and that's what we got back on the third meeting was that they did not approve that language on the ballot either. So that's the reason why we did not put it on the ballot. Fair enough, I think that's probably true. Uh, Dave, do you have anything you would wanna add? Is that what the city? No, that's my recollection, uh, may I, Madam Chair? Yes, oh, thank that's you. okay. Yeah, that was my recollection as well, Councilor. Any other discussion? Councilor Jamison. Back to the event center, actual construction of the building. Uh, Tr Tracy, the, I just wanna make sure I get this clear that the first two years would be interest only payments. After the first two years of just the interest payments, we'd turn and use the entertainment tax. Is that where the extra payment comes? No, no, where there would be no entertainment tax dollars. Under this plan, there would be no entertainment tax dollars used for bond payments. It's only when we get to... Not at all. Not at all. It would all come from second penny sales tax dollars. I just would... Maybe you're just still talking about the flexibility of being able to use it if we had to. Is that, is that what you're... I thought you referred in here to uh, something about the entertainment tax. Councilor Jamison, I can maybe clarify that for you. I, I believe it's, uh, if I may, Madam Chair. Yes. I believe it's, isn't it, it on the operational costs? The entertainment tax could be used to fund the operations if the uh, revenues um, don't come in. To revenues don't come in with that's, naming rights. That's, that's my recollection. That's okay. correct. And then, as well, if I could, the uh, $39 million that's estimated of the economic impact to the community, is that all new money? Or is it? Yes. That's new economic impact as a result of building the facility. Do we have a number for all the other facilities that we have in our city, the zoo, pavilion, or I don't believe we do. Um, just wondering what kind of a percentage, is this way over and above what we already have? I mean, just trying to gauge its impact compared to the other buildings. Uh, nope. Okay. I'm not an economist, yeah, I, I couldn't even venture a guess. I think we could probably get those for each of those entities would know what the arena's impact yeah. is, what the convention well, one thing, centers. One thing to keep in mind about the economic impact analysis that was done, they, they looked at new dollars coming to the community, not they, they, they looked at the total economic activity that's going to take place at the facility, and then f from that number they strip out dollars that are coming, that are already being spent here yeah, locally, okay. or that would come from local residents. So the, the $39 million number is new money that's not currently being spent in Sioux Falls that would come only as a result of having this facility and the, and the additional events in Sioux Falls. Okay, and one other uh, question for the designers, if I could. Probably not the construction guys, the designers, sorry. Uh, 
do we have a sample seat and sample like leg room set up that yes. we would we can get you that so basically and i didn't go into that detail today just to recall everyone we uh, we are using much wider than average seats 20 inch wide seats 19 is the average we have a number of 21 21 and a half inch in uh, two center sections and we have deeper rows uh significantly deeper rows in the lower bowl by two inches so like what we experienced today at the arena that's How much tight. wider would they be? So they'll be, uh, I think, let me see, two inches wider than the arena. And some of the arenas vary. They go from 18 uh, okay. to 19 inches. So they're wider than that, and they are deeper, and they're fully upholstered in the lower bowl and not fully upholstered in the upper bowl because of the number of times it will be used. Leg room? Leg room has an extra two inches okay. above what is required. And I'm not sure if the arena might even be lower than the current code. Mm -hmm. I'd have to go measure that. That may even be worse than the current code, which is 33 inches. So we have deeper, deeper seats than that. Okay. Okay. Councillor Brown. I'm just working from memory here, so don't trust the numbers completely. But in terms of economic impact, I know the pavilion is about $13 million a year. The arena is in that neighborhood, and so is the zoo, somewhere in that 10 to $15 million a year economic impact. Um, and that goes into to my question and, and maybe more of a concern when we talk about the flexibility of using the entertainment tax uh, to offset operations at the event center should the naming rights not come in and support that fully. That entertainment tax supports the operation of those three facilities. And I'm fearful what happens to those facilities should we ever have to use the entertainment tax. And I, I don't know if that's something you can answer today, Tracy, or not. but. Uh, um, we're sort of, if we ever had to use those entertainment taxes to, to pay the operations of the event center, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. I can at least partly respond to that. The, uh, of course, the, the bond issue that's to be paid off in 2014 is uh, partly paid from the second penny, which I mentioned. It is also largely paid from entertainment tax dollars currently. So there is over $2 million of entertainment tax dollars that are currently being used to make bond payments that will no longer go to make bond payments after 2014. And so those dollars will be freed up and, and, and available for funding for the pavilion, the convention center, uh, or potentially the event center should it be needed. That's a, a significant amount of additional dollars that are available. And, and we've looked at, at projecting out uh, for a number of years into the future and, and played with different scenarios as to how much money might, might be needed. Uh, the, the Pavilion and the Convention Center both have long-term capital projects. They both have certain deferred projects that have not been done because of the need to make those bond payments. We have anticipated that going forward, we would, would get caught up on those needs, those capital needs uh, for the pavilion and the convention center and still have uh, some level of, of comfort that there would be additional uh, entertainment tax dollars available as a backstop for the event center. So I, the best answer, of course, I, I, can't, I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen in the future, but the best guess we can make, the best estimate we can make based on the information we have today is that there would we would still be able to meet the needs of the pavilion and the convention center uh, as far out as they've been projected to this point and still have a, a reasonable backstop for the event center operations, somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a million dollars to a million dollars. Thank you. Councillor Anderson, Jr. I was just going to answer Councilman Jamison's uh, question about impact and uh, talk to the CVB or the chamber. They actually have a new formula now. I believe the council did get an email on that. If not, I'll see if I still have it and forward that to you. But they just came out with a new formula, how they determine economic impact. Councilor Antiman. <clears throat> I think what's interesting here is that we do have the professionals in this city through the CVB that will be charged with getting out to promote this event center and hopefully increase the usage and the opportunities we have to make more money. Terry Ellis Schmidt and her team, I believe, are very good at what they do. And we've also positioned ourselves, I might add, if you recollect, the $2 bid that we passed. 
Uh, we have positioned ourselves by giving additional financing to the CVB by providing them with a source in which they're going to have additional monies to get out and promote the city of Sioux Falls. And as we go forward with increase in the hotel, hopefully the hotels, seeing additional hotels as well, as well as higher occupancy, we will have more dollars available to help promote this event. I do believe it's going to be successful. I think the city finance team has done an excellent job of projecting out as far as the CIP for the five years that they've done. Um, I think this is a great opportunity. And what we are going to do hopefully this evening, the bond as far as the voting uh, language that we have I think is very easy to understand. And hopefully we're going to present this to the people tonight and let them have the ultimate decision to make the vote on this. And they, will going to, they are going to be charged with, with learning more about this project to better understand it, just like we're asking the questions here. Hopefully we're going to have the public out there asking those same questions. And I hope that we're all going to be out there helping to answer those questions and getting the information that they need. Thank you. Councilor Jamison. Look, I've scratched a lot of these questions off, so that's good, right? I mean, we'll get through these and we'll be done, but a couple more if I could. Uh, do we have any signed leases with any potential tenants for the new event center? We won't get those until we actually build it? No, we have no signed leases uh, with any potential tenants. Uh, well, then we've got you know optimism amongst the, the folks who certainly would like to have it built. Um, and, and it wouldn't be the responsible or prudent thing to do anyway for any businesses to sign a, a lease or, or an agreement without even knowing if there's going to be uh, um, a new venue for them to, to play in or to take advantage of. Well, Mayor, the prudent part of it is our side and the fact that if we're going to spend $115 million on a building, surely we would like to have tenants agreed to be leasing our building. That's the responsible thing to do. If you were building a strip mall, surely you wouldn't build it and bet on the hope for them to come. You would have leased tenants, leases signed. In fact, the bank probably wouldn't even give you money to do it. Well, actually, uh, Councillor Jameson, uh, when you get into a business venture, uh, you look at the potential opportunity uh, amongst, the, uh, amongst that, that uh, proposal that you've submitted to the banker, uh, and you base it on uh, you know, the ability to, to make profit or not. Uh, we have been very, very clear from the beginning. The primary tenant for this facility is the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, uh, if Terry L. Schmidt uh, were to come before a bank and outline her pr business proposal, as she has done very eloquently, uh, she has outlined, number one, uh, opportunity lost, and that is uh, a business opportunity that they have not been able to, to take advantage of because they don't have the facility to do it. Uh, they've talked about uh, opportunities that they have today that they could do even better on, such as with the the farm shows, the sportsman shows, the home shows, um, uh, and, and events like that where they, they've got great business but they just want to expand it. Uh, and they've talked about the potential for those big, big events that they've always wanted to do but, again, didn't have the, the opportunity to do that, such as Pheasants Forever um, and, 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 and events like that. Uh, again, I think that one of the things that we've been cautious in trying to be prudent and responsible in is we've tried to be conservative in our numbers. Uh, I think that, that um, Tracy, if, if anything, he, he did a very good job at that. He provided not only conservative numbers, but he provided great flexibility so that you don't get boxed in uh, to, to potentially impacting other venues that we care about so much in our, in our community, such as the zoo, such as the pavilion, such as other things like that. And that is why I think that the strength of, of the proposal uh, uh, is, has been outlined in, in, in the way that it, that it has. Um, we're trying to be cautious. We're trying to be prudent. We're trying to be responsible. Uh, we made a commitment to you that, uh, that, that this particular investment, if we did it, would put us into a, a dark hole or, or back us into a corner or bankrupt us or, or things like that. We are not Washington, D.C. In D.C., they do things like that. In Sioux Falls, we don't. And I just want to be very clear to you that uh, we went into this with, with that commitment uh, to, to folks like, uh, like the council that care so much about this city. And, and, 
and these venues. And, and I think they, they did just that uh, very, very well. Councilor Jamison. Two items, but it'll be real brief. Uh, first, if Terry Ellis Schmidt was here and all we were trying to do was double her business, we wouldn't spend $115 million on an event center and only rent out the floor. We spend a fraction of that and double her flat floor space right in her own building. The other thing is, last week, the price went up $5 million. Do you need any more time to get an accurate number? If I could address those, there was a, there was a comment that was made by one of the experts that we hired. Uh, I think it was Don Deadlifts or, or it was Dan Mills. I, I can't remember. Uh, I told you that the primary tenant was CVB. But there was a comment that was made by either Dan or Don, and I apologize, but with this facility, we'll be able to kill two birds with one stone. Uh, not only will we have the ability to have conventions, but we can do many other things, such as concerts, such as rodeos, such as high school graduations, such as Christian music festivals, such as expanded farm shows, such as things like that. And that's the power of this facility when you attach it to the existing convention center and arena uh, site. And then, uh, Councilor Jameson, oh, I'm going to lose my thought. Your last point was on uh, the, the 110 versus the 150. Councilor Jameson, we could, uh, we could take more time and we could spend one, $120 million. We could spend $130 million. We could spend $140 million. We could. Uh, the, the, the document that has been presented by the team that we've hired, they gave us a range. They said, we can build you a really nice facility for 110. But they also said that there are other amenities, other features, other benefits that you may want to consider for your facility that will last you this 50 years uh, and future generations. And that's why we did add some flexibility there as well to add some of those amenities or those features, and that's why they came up with the 115 number. Um, in all honesty, we, we certainly could have went 120, 125, 130. We could. Again, we tried to find that common ground, that compromise, and that reasonableness that we believe that the people of Sioux Falls will want us to do. And, and you know what, I, again, just to be clear, I should, uh, Dan or Don, can the city of Sioux Falls build a quality facility that will last us for generations to come for 115? Can we do that? I mean, this is an opportunity. And no smoke. Talk to the people of Sioux Falls. Let them know. When... When I was on the last event center, uh, I was going, attending the last event center task force meetings. You know, Jim and people like Terry Balloon, they kept talking about you've got to build something for generations to come. And, I mean, you need to tell the people, can we do that? Please. Dan Mills with Mortensen. Yes, absolutely, we can build a quality facility for $115 million. And to be honest, when we first brought on board and the budget was... 99 and a half million, we were nervous. Could we build it for 99 and a half? Yes, we could. Do you want to build it right? We need to do it for 115 million. And that was our recommendation to the, to the city. Let's take those lumps right now and build it right for 115 million. And also to get all the features that we have discussed all the way along. I think one of the meetings where we were at, we heard from the business community also and said, well, you know, if you have a hockey building and you do that bigger floor, we got to worry about the intimacy. We've got to worry about the home teams. We've got to worry about the basketball seating. So in our budget, in the $115 million, we have extra telescopic seats on each end so we can cre create the great sight lines for the um, basketball games. And that's probably, I think that was a five or $600,000 item. So we went down a number of items like that, said, do we have to do these? Probably you could build it without it, but then someone in the community might be disappointed because that was a really key feature to them. So we put those things in that $115 million budget to make sure, you know, the building does have that flexibility. It does have the revenue potential for the great video boards and those kind of things. We think that will help you on your average annual cost and then also the operations we put in very good mechanical systems we're trying to be sustainable so this it is more cost effective to run this building so we're looking at both the expense side and the revenue side and that's one of the reasons it went from the 110 that had been discussed at one point to the 115 but we think that higher quality building is going to really create the ideal building for Sioux Falls 
Councillor Antiman. Thank you. Uh, I did forget to mention, too, when I talked about Terry Ellis Schmidt and the CVB, an another factor that we've got in this, which I'm excited about, too, and he's expressed this numerous times to us, is the Sioux Falls Sports Authority and uh, the opportunities that they're going to have with this facility, too. Not only have, have they indicated to us some of the opportunities that they've missed because we haven't had the right size facility, but also because we didn't have the right amenities, such as the needed platforms for, t for television, for televising these events. Uh, what we've also learned through the different task forces that we had is that not only was the facility not modern enough, and we've discussed this time and time again, not only was the facility that we have at the current arena not modern enough, but we didn't have enough facilities. So what this, this event center will do is will, will give us that opportunity and that potential for even more. Because if all you do is take the existing people that we have and put them into the new event center, you, we haven't accomplished anything here. We haven't, inc we haven't increased any days for other operations or programs to come in or for other events. So I really do believe that by having the facility, at the event center at that location, it opens up the fan experience, as Mike Sullivan has talked about. It gives us potential for additional events and more events, which is part of that economic potential that we talk about. I think it's a great plan. I think the mayor and his staff has done a super job in presenting this to us. The experts have listened to people in the public time and time again. I think a number of us have attended different meetings with them and took input from not only teams but also from, from private citizens. I look forward to bringing this thing forward tonight. Councillor Jamison, and then I get the next question. Oh, very good. Thank you. Uh, the idea is that I think we started off in the beginning where the goals, and I think they got probably eliminated due to cost, but I think one of our goals was to make this building expandable, flexible enough so we could grow it as we grew as a community. And the idea of making it a uh, green LEED certified, how would those two options change the cost? Basically, as we proceed through our next phase, if the vote is successful, if you put it to a vote, um, is design development. And we have looked at options, just so you know, of expanding the building. And there's two or three different ways to do that. One is on the end. One is kind of a floating ring, kind of like they're doing in Madison Square Garden in New York. So we're still investigating that. And we're designing the roof so that it can hold that. So we haven't totally eliminated that possibility. It just needs more work. That piece is a little complicated. Uh, so we're still working on that because we have a nice knock that option out. Um, and then when it comes to sustainable, we have put in the idea is that this is going to be lead silver is the goal. Um, and again, one of the biggest things we do is the energy efficiency of the building. And we have a very good high efficiency system uh, for mechanical. We'll look at lighting controls. We'll look at the control system. We have a lot of different features in this building to save energy. But lead also includes things like saving water and recycling materials. And We'll be working closely with Mortensen on all of those things to make sure that this is a sustainable building. So that is has not been eliminated from the discussions in order to do this. Okay, great. The, but the flexibility to expand it isn't structurally on the outside. It's really the ability to add more seats, right? Yes. And percentage-wise, it would be like a 10% increase? That so basically, no. What we're doing is we are designing it so that we would be able in the future to either hang from the roof additional rows of seats above the upper balcony, or we're comparing that system to the ability to fill in the seating bowl on the end in the future. Again, if you remember, what we did is very similar to the building we did in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which has been massively financially successful, and they're now got an NHL team. Um, but we don't have the end in there. I, we don't have the upper bowl end. And so we're still looking at the options of how, you know, we're not doing that now, but we're designing the lower columns so we could add that and extend the big roof truss to allow those seats in the future. Okay, very good. Councilor Karski. I could have been second to you, Councilor. No, that's fine. Okay. Um, Don, question if I could regarding the LEED certification. Uh, and I've learned this through the uh, Westside Library that you know, the LEED certification basically is mostly, a, from what I understand it, a tax um, uh, tool that businesses use. By becoming certified, they're able to um, capitalize on their, on their tax basis. 
Um, and I know there's a cost to lead certification. On a project like this, what is the cost of lead so, certification? Yeah, there's, there's different, co when you get a project this big, there's different costs. So the first thing is using those sustainable principles. So the first one is we are going to do a centralized cooling and heating plant. That alone is costing you an extra million dollars. But that's the right thing to do because it's going to save you over the lifetime of the building. So we've assumed that in this price. So that's probably the biggest cost item of doing, uh, having lead or, or just doing good sustainability. So you'll have all of those kind of features, some of the recycling, those kind of things. That might cost a tiny bit, but so many of the contractors are used to doing that. Using less water, using water efficient fixtures, that's really not costing you anything. Doing less irrigation in landscaping, that's probably saving you money. You know, doing bicycle racks, that costs you a little money, but you should do that for a building like this anyway. So there's a whole wide range. And then the final thing is getting the certification. So that is costing you a little money, and I think that's probably, I believe, a few hundred thousand for something like a building of this scale to go through the whole big process of doing all the form work, all the paperwork, and then you get the plan at the end that says you are certified uh, lead silver. So that does cost a little money to do, do that. Some of our buildings we've done, people have said, we just want you to use all those sustainable principles, but don't go for the certification because we don't want to do the paperwork and we want to save that money. If the city decides to do that, that would be fine as well. But we're still trying to integrate all these sustainable principles because, again, that will save you money in the end. It will cost you less to run this building over the life of it, and it's going to be around for a long, long time. And I guess that was my point. I mean, we have the blueprint there to be for everything we want to do to be sustainable, but we don't necessarily have to spend six figures. That's right. To get that the would be your choice after we get through this to say, hey, we want to use all those sustainable principles, but not go get the certification. That would be the choice of the city if they want to tell us that. That's fine, but we still think it's very smart to make sure this is a very energy efficient and sustainable building. Any other questions? If not. I just want to make sure, Director Turbeck, that I'm understanding what I think I'm hearing. When you projected the, um, the finance or financial package, you looked at 4.5%. Is that what you figured the interest rate as? Between 4 and 4.5%, four and correct. And you had said earlier today that that projection is a bit high for what we're seeing right now? Correct. Um, so then in, in previous uh, presentations, you said that um, it's $115 million for the building, but then 1 to 1.5 percent for, it, I'll call them administrative costs. I Co don't. Cost of issuance is the term we use. And then we have to have a reserve. Is that reserve a certain percentage or? Typically, the reserve would be equal to your maximum annual payment in any one year. Okay, so I mean is there a total estimate that when we get to the point of bonding what the total amount will be that we're looking at? For $115 million, a project with $115 million in costs it would be around $125 million in bonds issued. Keeping in mind that that debt service reserve is not money to be spent, it, it's money we take from the, the bond uh, the, the people that we sell the bonds to, we set it in a trust account. It sits there till the, the bonds are all matured, and then it goes back to the investors. And that trust account, does that earn interest? Yes. Okay. So, and again, um, the council, before any bonds are let or issued, we will have another vote on that. Is that correct? It, it will require council action to authorize the issuance of bonds. Assuming a, an affirmative vote in November, the council would have to take action after that to issue bonds. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the, uh, the presenters? If not, thank you all very much. So and one, oh, one quick thing, please. Sure. Councillor Anderson, Jr. I'm sorry I didn't mention this earlier. On Friday, I had the... Uh, great experience of giving a welcoming speech to the Kiwanis Clubs of the Dakotas and Minnesota at the Convention Center. Um, I wanted to thank the Convention Center staff for taking care of them. And I also would like to recognize Scott Cavanaugh, the former general manager of the Convention Center who's no longer with us. Thank you for your service to Sioux Falls, sir. Anything else to come before this body? If not, 